Tonight, Pen and Teller will produce 100,000 stinging bees with their bare hands. Run a truck over a human being while Victoria Jackson watches. Play with fire. Make Jane Curtin do disgusting magic. Stick body parts in dangerous bear traps. And give away magic secrets. Don't try this at home. Good evening. My name is Penn Gillette. This is my partner, Teller. We are Penn and Teller. And this is a show called Don't Try This at Home. We are doing this show on stage in front of a live audience of 900 people. So why am I whispering? Because we don't want the audience to know that the show has already started. We are hiding. To the 900 people behind us getting comfortable, the stage looks empty except for three big sheets of plate glass. They probably think it's some postmodern negative utopian statement of bleakness by our set designer. But it isn't three big sheets of glass. The middle one is a mirror. This is just a reflection of this. You've heard the expression, it's all done with mirrors? Well, in this case, it really is. We're right back here. Watch this. It's pretty cool. They don't notice disembodied fingers coming out of nowhere on a brilliantly illuminated stage. What do you have to do to get someone's attention? for the national magic trick. Look, my hands are empty. Look, a little white hanky. Watch closely. Not closely enough, it's gone. But a little wiffle dust and it's back. Thank you. Everybody now, look, my hands are empty. Look, a little white hanky. Watch closely. Not closely enough, it's gone. But a little whipple dust and it's back. Thank you. One more time. Look, my hands are empty. It's Penn and Teller. Don't try this at home. Joining us tonight are Jane Curtin and Victoria Jackson. We'll be back in a minute with more swindles and scams. It's gone. A little whiffle dust and it's back. Thank you. Now, you might be wondering if we had to break some sort of magician's code of secrecy to teach 900 people how to do that little hanky thing, and <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> and there are probably some magicians, some tuxedo-clad lowlifes that actually put their cheesy little secrets above patriotism. That was nothing compared to the opening. I mean, that mirror thing. That is a basic principle of magic that has been kept secret for hundreds, thousands of years. And I know we're going to get some letters on that. But before you put a stamp on and lick that envelope, Mr. Rabbit Puller, scope this out. You're really going to hate us for this.
stuff like that with the clear boxes because everybody thinks they know how magic is done. And if they don't know, you tell them. Yeah, but what I mean is people think that if they think enough, they can just figure it out on their own. They can, because it's so easy. Oh, really? Well, figure this one out, Victoria. Later in the show, I'm going to drive a truck, a 55-foot rig on 6th Avenue, New York City, in front of all these people, right over Teller's chest. Here's 6th Avenue now. And there, glistening in the New York City night, is the truck. That's where Teller be lying, right under the wheels. And I'll be driving the 16-ton rig directly over the little guy's chest. It's never been done before, but we wanted more. So we added over 30,000 pounds of concrete to the back to make this really heavy. Yep, I'm going to drive this truck over Teller's chest at the end of the show. Now, if you're going to have a friend lie down on the street and drive a truck over him, what would you do? Well, it depends on the friend. Let's say it's Teller. But I don't hardly know him. Well, you'll pretend you do, okay? Okay, all right. Um, it's very easy. It could be a trick truck. It could be a reinforced chest thing. Mirrors. No, we, are, we already used mirrors in the opening of the show. But uh, let's test your theories. We have some, uh, some models right over here. Notice how the models are exact scale. 
what we're really going to be using. Uh, we've got a truck here that's made out of a cinder block, while Teller is constructed out of a jelly donut with breadstick legs and a marshmallow head. Now let's see what happens when, without any trickery whatsoever, with these scale models, we run the truck over Teller. It's not very pretty, is it, Victoria? No. Okay, now, what were your ideas again? A trick truck. Trick truck. Good one. We'll try a trick truck. Now, this looks like the same scary, menacing cinder block truck, but closer inspection reveals it's just styrofoam. It couldn't hurt a fly. But very bad for the environment. <laughs> mm. Wow. Even just the light frame of our styrofoam truck is too much for our tasty donut teller. Any other ideas? Yes. Costly hardware and a reinforced chest. Good thinking. Once again, we're back to using the same cinder block truck. But surely teller is safe with his high-tech protective gear, a spoon, which is going to go over him and protect him completely. Time to kill the donuts. Ah! Oh, the humanity. Is there no end to the madness? Any other ideas, Donut Death Queen? Yes. What about if you used a fake teller? What about a fake teller? We have that set up, too. Okay, this time we've hidden teller's body safely in a manhole under the street and put the fake body up on the street, okay? For those of you who are squeamish, don't worry. That's not a real donut under this tinfoil. The donut is safe. Well... <laughs> Nobody said science was easy. We've tried the fake truck, the reinforced chest, and the phony teller, and as of now, nof nothing works. Uh, any, um, that's about it, don't you think? No, they always include other as a possibility. Yeah. Well, folks, this is a good time for you people at home and here in the studio to make your own bets. This show is even more exciting when you've got a couple hundred bucks riding on it. Isn't it, Victoria? Yes. At the end of the show, we're going to drive a 50-foot rig over Teller's chest right here in New York City for this crowd, and then we'll show you how he did it. Stay tuned, and don't try this at home. TV. Everything is fake on TV. You all know that. These are props we've used in previous shows. Weapons and body parts. Sure, they're fake, but we love them as if they were our own. We believe violence is exciting in entertainment. In America, we have the First Amendment. There are no censors. But there are anti-violence censorship letter writers. They want to make sure you'll never see anything that they wouldn't want to see. They say that if we had nothing on TV but shows like 30-something and Growing Pains, all the world problems we worked out in an adult, peaceful manner. They don't understand everything's fake on TV. Homer Simpson doesn't work in a nuclear power plant. Homer Simpson is just an actor. <laughs> But these special interest groups are very powerful. They force me to state the obvious, that this is not my body, this is a fake body. Here's my real body right back here. With all the switches, gizmos, squibs, charges, and hydraulics to make the really powerful and completely phony and safe special effects you're about to see. But we needed to establish cause and effect. We needed a weapon. They said no guns. They said no sharp objects. They said no blunt objects. So we came up with a compromise. These are marshmallows. <laughs> the same marshmallows we used for Teller's head. Cost effective. They couldn't hurt anyone. And if you don't believe me, buy yourself a bag and try using them to hold up a convenience store. <laughs> 
Okay, tell her. Let's do it. Ouch! Ah! That's not my blood! I'm okay! There's no pain! What? Ah! I'm just setting him off with this hand! I'm just hitting the button! There's no... Ah! There's no problem at all! I'm absolutely fine! Ah! Ah! Isn't this great? Isn't this wonderful? There'll be no more violence anywhere! There'll be no more crime in Detroit! And, and, and... Guess what, kids? You can try this at home! Oh no, he's going for my eye! No, my, oh God! There's a marshmallow in my eye! Oh no! Ah! 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 ah. And don't worry, I'm totally okay! How could I be hurt? It's just a marshmallow! Symbol of decency! Ah!
We're Penn and Teller. We got more things you shouldn't try at home. Stay tuned. We get asked pretty often how we got into theater, how we got into magic. I don't really answer. They don't want me to answer. They want to hear about Houdini and swindling and trickery and honest lying. The truth is more complex. How I got here is not very linear. I spent summers in the woods camping with my parents. I walked in the woods alone. I explored. And I discovered the thing that would make me who I wanted to be. The thing that put me in this show. It was a beaver trap. I found it in the stream. It was set and it caught nothing. I knew it was very dangerous. I knew it belonged to someone else. But I picked it up carefully so as not to crush my fingers. I picked it up carefully so as not to scare myself to death by setting it off accidentally. I carried the beaver trap back to my parents. My parents taught me not to steal. My parents raised me well. My parents hated trappers. They hated the whole idea of a trap that couldn't close tight enough to break the bone or the tortured, panicked animal be able to chew its leg off too swiftly. To them, I was a hero. I'd, I'd saved an innocent animal from a horrible death, and I could keep the trap as a reminder of the cruelty of some of my species and a promise that I would grow up differently. <laughs> I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted to keep the trap. And now it was mine. When summer was over, I carried the beaver trap back to my home. I kept it in my room. I oiled it. I decided I would become an expert. I got my first job. I was root supervisor for a giveaway newspaper. I was a spot checker. I went door to door and made sure the other paper boys had done their jobs properly. I bought mouse and rat. I bought prairie dog and weasel. I filled gumball machines one summer, and I bought otter and wildcat. I learned everything about the traps. I learned how some traps are set in the water so the animal will drown. I learned how every trap is marked with a number that indicates the strength of the jaws. I learned how the chain that comes off the trap is not attached to a tree, but rather to a log called a drag, which confuses and tires the animal, but doesn't allow it any leverage. I kept my respect and conquered my fear. I sent away for books and catalogs from the back of Field and Stream magazine. Whenever one came in the mail, as soon as I'd opened it, I'd write in the front. I'd write the date. I'd write how much I paid, the address to which I had sent. And then I'd write my name. And after my name, I'd put a comma. And after the comma, in quotations, I would write, King of animal traps.
I got older, I washed dishes for a whole summer and bought bear. I finally had a bear trap. It came in a box. It was used. It was an antique, a piece of Americana. It was really big, a little rusty, with big menacing teeth that frightened me more than it could possibly frighten any animal. When this trap was set off, the force of the jaws would be such that it would probably destroy the pelt of anything smaller than a bear. To set this trap, I knew you needed a tool. The trap was too strong to set by standing on it. The mechanism was too powerful to be moved by full body weight. I needed a tool to pry open the bars, a tool to get it set, and I mastered it. I was not an animal. I was human. I had a thumb. I had sense in my head, and I could set the trap and not be harmed. I could set the trap, get the bait, and not be injured. I was king of animal traps. I showed my classmates my skill. They were impressed, but not impressed enough that I felt I could make it a career. So I broadened my horizons, and I diluted my goals. And that's how I got to be half of Penn and Teller. You know, there's a certain kind of rivalry among magicians, a kind of one-upmanship. And we get compared once in a while to Sigmund and Leroy, the Vegas act. Uh, I guess because they're the other two-man magic act. And everybody gets all excited because they produce five Bengal tigers out of empty boxes. Well, you want wild animals? We got wild animals. Tell her, build a tila, ein, zwei. Five, four, six, seven. Okay, so they're not Bengal tigers, but they are alien, six-legged, hairy monsters capable of injecting your flesh with a deadly poison. Yes, they're bees. But I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, yeah, but Sigmund and Leroy putting those little tigers in the little tiny boxes must have killed a few. They probably have more than five tigers that they've produced in their life. So let's... Let's do a number equal to every tiger Sigmund and Leroy ever produced. There we go. There's for all the ones they produced other times. And what about all the little bunnies and doves and kittens that they ever pulled out of anywhere? I think we've covered Sigmund and Leroy. Let's go on to the other magicians. Doug Henning, here's your whole act. And Doug, there's your life, Doug Henning. There's every single animal Doug Henning ever produced in his life. While we're at it, let's go with... Blackstone, you got your, you got your Copperfield, you got your Thurston, you got your Kreskin. I know what you're thinking, Kreskin's a mentalist, but I'm sure he pulled a bunny or two in his life. And besides, this bee right here reads minds at least as well as Kreskin. How about all the amateur magicians? Here's the amount of animals produced by all the amateur magicians in North America. Those are all the scouts that do little dove acts. All, all those North America, that counts Canada, that counts Mexico. What about South America? I think we got South America. Tell her, this, oh, here's South America. South America's over here, I made a mistake. South America's now on my hand. This one is stinging me, ouch. Okay, we got South America, we got, ooh, 
is Antarctica. Every animal produced in Antarctica is stinging me right next to Greenland. And we also got Europe and Africa covered here. Don't get Europe and Africa on my Europe and Africa. And what about Australia? Well, put another B on the Barbie. And how about Japan? You want Japan? They love livestock in Japan. Here's Japan, China, and Russia right there. You know, don't produce the animals in China. It's our lady want to produce some more. And you know, well, we don't want to do all one kind of animal, do we? There's another kind of animal we want to do, too, and that is a rabbit out of a hat. There's nothing at all scary about a rabbit, is there? Well, how about this rabbit, huh? I wonder how many children watching tonight are going to be talking about that to a court-appointed psychiatrist. There we have it. Siglin and Leroy, you are wimps. We have one million bees in this... Okay, it's not a million bees, it's more like... 100,000 days. It's still more animals than produced by all the magicians. Okay, now it's a million bees. Sigmund and Leroy, you are wimps. It is your move and say the trap. Sigmund and Leroy, don't try this at home. And now, with some happy magic, here is Jane Curtin in the balcony. Jane Curtin. Don't you just love seeing magic? David Copperfield, Bill Bixby. I'd like to do an old-fashioned sleight-of-hand trick called the Everlasting Ribbon. It's very special to me because my grandmother taught it to me when I was a little girl. Would you two please help me? Sure. Come up, if you would stand over on this side. Your names? Debbie. Debbie. Bob. Bob, nice to meet you. Oh, now this is a close-up magic trick. It's good for only a few people at a time. So would the rest of the audience please leave? You can take the elevator, go out on the street. You'll meet Penn and Teller out there where they will amuse you. <laughs> please try to go quietly. Thank you. Now, my grandmother told me that a ribbon is like an invisible link that binds us and it can never be broken. Let's see if she's right. Night. Debbie, would you cut this ribbon, please? Sure. There are some scissors right down there. There we go. Now, when my grandmother used to do this, this trick, she used to sing a little Irish ribbon song. I can't remember the words or the tune, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, there. Now, if you each would take an end, and don't hold it too tight, and Debbie, if you would give me the scissors, I'll just cut off these unsightly ends, because part of the ribbon trick is that it has to be very neat. There. Whoop. This is hard to cut here. There we go. Okay, now. If Debbie, you would place one hand under the knot, and Bob, if you could place a hand above the knot, very gently, and think of something that has been broken, whether it's a promise or someone's heart. Now, I will pull. See? When you love someone, it's never too late to fix the things you've broken. Thank you so much, Bob, Debbie. I'd like you to have this ribbon as a memento. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Penn and Teller hated that trick. They said, what the hell does Grandma Curtin know about magic? If I was on their show, they told me I'd have to do a Penn and Teller trick. So they came up with the infected ear. It wasn't my fault. It was designed by Penn and Teller, and I'm not even responsible for the words I'll be saying while I'm doing it. From here on in, I'm just an actor reading my lines off cue cards like Homer Simpson. It's just a gig. Good evening. My name is Jane Curtin, and I've got some show on NBC. It's called Working Out on Saturdays at 8.30. I was so proud when Penn and Teller, my idols, asked me to perform this very special trick on their show. I need a couple of people from the audience. You, you, get up here. Oh, Debbie, Bob, hi. <laughs> Debbie, I see you've practiced self-mutilation for the sake of fashion. You've got pierced ears just like I do. Bob, would you examine my ear, please? 
as far as you can tell, is there a hole in the lobe of my ear, yes. and is that hole surrounded by flesh? Yes, it's a regular The earring. wire of the earring is going through my flesh. Is that correct, Bob? That's correct, yes. Okay. If you had to get this earring out of my ear without unfastening the catch, you'd probably have to pull on that earring pretty hard, hard enough to break the earring or to rip my flesh. Is that correct? Uh -huh. <laughs> we don't have to do that. Debbie, would you be so kind as to thread this embroidery needle with dental floss? Have you ever done that before? No. Well, why don't we see if you can do it? Just take the little needle out of there okay. and put it right through. And Bob, would you unhook the earring and take it out of my ear, please? Right. Is there anything unusual about that earring, Bob? It's a regular earring. Regular, regular ear. ear. Regular ear. Okay. Here we go. Are we through? There. Yep. Okay. Now, Debbie, if you would just help me guide this embroidery needle through my ear. Oh, if you can see that this is just a, a regular brand name dental floss. There's the brand. Okay. There's the brand. All right. Now, kids, don't try this at home. Okay, Debbie. Now, can you... Actually, if you get me that little hand mirror, maybe I can see what I'm doing. Okay. This is a very, very difficult part of the trick. Sort of needs surgeon's hands. Oh, there we go. Okay. There. Now, can you actually see the needle going through the hole in my ear? Can you yes. see that, Bob? Yes, I can. Debbie, can you see it? Yep. Okay. Now, I'm going to actually pull this needle with the dental floss through the hole in my ear so that the dental floss will be going through my... Ah, no, it's okay. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Ah. There we go. There we go. See? Okay, Bob, would you tug on that dental floss, please, just to make sure that it is actually through my ear? Right. Okay? Okay. okay. Now, if I said right now on national television that Penn and Teller thought that floss being ripped through my earlobe was an appropriate and funny gag, you'd do it, wouldn't you, Bob? I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> and now that I'm working for Penn and Teller and not some bleeding heart sitcom producer, if, uh, here we go, let me just take this out. You can just hold on to my hair if you would, Bob. There you go, Debbie. Okay. Now, I am going to hand you each an end to the dental floss. If you could take one end, Debbie. And Bob, if you could take the other end. Now, I'm just going to hold on to it a little bit because I'm nervous. <laughs> okay. Now, all right. Just keep pulling. Just keep pulling. Okay. Now pull. A little harder. Come on, you can do it. Come on. Ah, there you go. Okay, let's get a close up on that ear. Bob, would you check my ear and make sure that it's not damaged in any way? It's not damaged in any way. And my lobes have never been cleaner. Bob, Debbie, thank you so much. <laughs> I would like you both to have a piece of this dental floss as a memento. Boy, you guys have cleaned up. Uh, Bob, would you put my earring back on, please? Sure. Now, when we return, we'll be joining Penn on 6th Avenue, where he's ready to run a truck over his partner's chest. Oh, come on.
Um, say, Pen, uh, why the 30,799 pounds of concrete? Well, Victoria, that's where exactly one pound under the 70,000 pound weight limit imposed on New York City streets. We may be reckless, but we're not scofflaws. Trucks. The big rigs. Yeah, you see them every day. A mighty convoy hauling food, appliances, and furniture across this great land. The highways and byways, the veins and arteries of this wonderful country. And these are more than just trucks. They're blood cells, the very plasma that makes life possible. And how about the trucker? That new cowboy with that cow- the trick! Okay, I'm gonna run a truck over my partner Teller's chest. And I have to ask you people watching live one small favor. In the event of an accident, a ghastly mishap sure to involve crushed bones and severed limbs, please, no flash photography. It ruins the color balance for the viewers enjoying it at home. Hitchhiker. Rules of the road. I can't leave her stranded. I hope you don't smoke. Okay, Teller. Get your bets ready. It's your last chance. No bets will be placed after the truck is in motion. Take a look at the setup. Take a look at Teller. Take a look at the truck. What do you think? Is our truck trick a trick truck? <laughs> it's kind of a cute little tongue twister, isn't it? Is it a reinforced chest? Is it a fake teller? Or is it other? So why don't you, uh, why don't take another look at it here? Watch this. Tell her adjust his tie. Tell her is nothing if not dapper. He gets all set. Now think about it. Does that look like a trick truck? Does that look like a uh, reinforced chest on Teller? Is it going over a reinforced chest? Is that a ramp in there? What do you think? Maybe it's a fake Teller. Is that his real body? Is it moving right? What do you think? It's going to be time to pay up soon. Is this a special effect, a camera trick? What do you think? Watch again, only two more tires to see. Boom! Boom! What do you think? Trick truck, fake teller, reinforced chest, or other? How did we do it? The correct answer is trick truck. We got 6,000 pounds of stage weights, 8,000 pounds of wheel weights, and we got 3,000 pounds of concrete all over this side to counterbalance the foam rubber tires. I thought you said it looked frightening from over there, Victoria. I lied through my teeth, just like you told me to. Nice work, Victoria. I hope you made some money. I want to thank our guests, Victoria Jackson and Jane Curtin. My name is Penn Gillette. This is my partner, Teller. We're Penn and Teller. And don't try this at home.